I'm I'm so exhausted, and all I've been doing is watching this stuff on television. Yeah, we haven't even been through an emergency, and it's just like I feel like I've been activated for the last. <laughs> That's right. Just purely two like weeks. Twitter activated, right? Instagram yeah. activated. Just uh, exhausted by proxy by all this stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. Also exhausting is uh, that we've finished a game of thrones season and we have like two years before the next one are you going to compare these things for the the united states is hit by the first major coastal storm in in 12 years and there, you're going to compare it to the game of thrones finale there as you know there are game of thrones emergency management lessons to be learned mr <laughs> linkedin posting uh i'm referring to of course mitch wrote a great piece about uh what emergency managers can learn from game of thrones and it's got some really good stuff in there i think it's uh, out of all your academic publishing and professional publications this is the best one it's all about Jon snow no that i really yeah. think that's true um i think uh what are some of the highlights do you oh, remember really we're gonna do yeah. the highlight reel on this yeah. i'm still you know people are still without power in atlanta for no reasons that anybody can understand <laughs> but this is what people want to hear about all right Game well the, the lesson is about uh, yeah, Jon Snow and the humility of the emergency manager and how he puts building coalitions in front of his or her own success all the time. That's right. And I think, honestly, we have seen that in this response. Uh, it's been intense all the way. And I think FEMA rolled out right in front of it, uh, putting itself at the forefront kind of by leading from behind you know yeah it's been uh it's been a, but i'm so tired <laughs> i just i just it's it this is what i learned because i've been on paternity leave through this response right um which people might ne- even know that that's a thing in new york city we can go on paternity leave that's and right. and um well it is if you're a yeah that's right for managers for right. certain new york city managers you can go on paternity leave so i've been just holding a baby throughout <laughs> all of this response all of this crap is going down everywhere and it's just me and the baby just watching the people flooded out on television plus you're like sleep deprived so you're emotional you're holding a newborn that's it's right. like all I just, of that combined. i sob day and night it's just like jim i'm in Cantor an ERC, but i'm not... at you on the tv oh god jim make it stop jim make it stop <laughs> Does Jim Kentori scream? I don't know. The wind screams as it wraps around Jim Kentor. He would be an interesting guest That's on this right. podcast. Well, I think the thing that we need to talk about, and we can bring um, we can bring Jeff in on this yes. when you bring him in, is is this controversy, the weather person controversy. You know, the throwing the poor weathermen out in the gusts of, of wind and yeah. everybody's feeling for them. Yeah, social media, all sorts of social media things were a huge issue for both of these hurricanes harvey and irma and i saw a lot of people make note of the fact that that uh, social media wasn't really around for katrina and the last time we had major hurricanes hit but before we jump into the discussion there's just so much to talk about like we just want to start doing (laughs) what if we like forgot jeff was on the line it's it's like 45 minutes later we're like oh my god uh so let me introduce our guest uh we're very excited to have jeff on uh not only does he run an incredible emergency management podcast called disaster politics he uh, helps run an amazing center the national center for disaster preparedness at columbia university he's the deputy director he has tons of expertise in areas like public health preparedness community resilience integration of private and public sector capabilities so these are all things that uh that touched you know that were affected in in harvey and irma uh, some of the topics of his past work include developing inner organizational processes for operational epidemiological modeling. Say that three times fast. <laughs> evacuation and sheltering, medical dependencies, and adapting business intelligence systems for disaster response and recovery, which is something that's applicable to every single emergency management agency out there. He's advised leaders all across uh, local, state, federal, international organizations. I uh, briefed con- congressional staff. I've seen him on TV recently. He just came back from Texas. So, Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Shout out. Hey, thanks, guys. Long time listener, first time caller. I'm psyched <laughs> to be here. <laughs> yeah, we should also mention I've known Jeff, gosh, 10, uh, almost. Yeah, ten years, forty, now. fifty yeah. years. We're just we're old geezers. Has it really? Yeah, it's been so long. It's been a long, 
time. So I'm excited to talk to you about some of these things. And I want to give to to everybody, because a lot of our listeners are, um, you know, hardcore emergency managers. And as soon as you say somebody's from Columbia University, it's like that old um, salsa commercial. Do you know when somebody's like, New York City, get a rope? Do you remember that commercial? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I actually, I I used. I used that in sort of our prep meetings before we went down into Texas to be very sensitive to yeah. the Pace Picante effect. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear how your how you did introduce yourself when you went went down there. But first, I guess well, let me finish the oh, the sorry. end of the sentence was. Oh, yeah, but I think Jeff <laughs> has real props and real things to say about emergency management. Absolutely, Picante yeah. sauce and all. He's the best kind of academic in that he backs it up with a ton of real world experience and uh, know how. So. We're excited to have you, Jeff. And I'm just curious, starting off, how did you get involved in emergency response world, emergency management world? Yeah, you know, that's uh, um, an interesting question that I'm not entirely sure I know the answer to, but I'll try and (laughs) come up with one. Um, So, uh, you know, I um, uh, was involved with uh, public health. I did my my master's degree in public health and health policy and management and really kind of focused on two areas. And it was international health, which I was really interested in, and uh, bioterrorism, which was post 9-11. And so that was um, a topic that people were concerned with. So I did a lot of studies on that, which actually turned into an internship before I had even graduated with the Boston Public Health Commission and um, ended up in my last semester taking on a full-time planning position with them. And this is in the glory days of, uh, you know, 2004 when funding was at its peak, the city's readiness initiative. Yeah. Yeah. And we were fighting over just the stupidest crap, like which (laughs) positions belonged where and ICS and everything. Swimming Um, in (laughs) swimming pools of gold coins. Yeah, yeah, and you didn't have to get along with emergency management because you had your public health money, and so it was, anyway, it was, um, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, there was so much going on, and there was so much opportunity. It was also, I mean, as an intern, I was able to to back up EMS and the Unified Command Center for the Democratic National Convention in 2004, which was one of the first special national special security events post 9-11. So it's just, a lot of it was timing and it just being at the intersection of some really important things happening when there was a lot going on. Um, and, uh, you know, really just, just um, being in the right place at the right time and being able to work with some amazing people. And so, you know, I sort of got my chops in public health as a planner and then spent some time as an epidemiologist and developing plans for the Communicable Disease Control Division vision there, moved over to Yale and sort of worked both inward looking at the health system and outward and more of a quasi consulting environment. And now, now at Columbia and kind of this uh, uh, academic based think tank where, you know, we're trying to take the best research that's available, but apply it to contemporary policy issues and practical issues so that the best science is actually having an impact on the work that we're facing in the field and not just sort of going on the shelf and, and helping someone get tenure status. And you see that that's a need, right? As you go out and visit these emergency management agencies, that um, that people are, are looking for, you know, often so busy dealing with the day to day emergencies, it's hard to know what the latest science and data is out there. So you're helping connect that research and science to the emergency management agencies, right? Yeah, and absolutely. And as you look across the different sectors, I mean, we speak different languages. The way we present data, the way we process it, the way we talk among our peers in academia is very different than the way we present information and value it and work with it in the practice fields and in the policy fields. And so we'll sort of take the best research. Sometimes we conduct it. Sometimes we're using other people's research and try to apply that to uh, whether it's a training course that we're developing or more of a consulting gig where we're helping to develop a product for uh, an agency and on the policy side and through some of our media where we're pushing, you know, funding issues and talking about the practical impacts and, and the research that backs it up uh, and as well as doing, you know, briefings on the Hill and some of the advisory roles and things like that. So really being able to translate across the different sectors, I think is, is what differentiates our center. And, and it's a big reason on why I, I even consider taking a position in academia, no disrespect to academia. It's just, these are, these are the ones that, um, you know, I'm, I tend to be more, more impact oriented. So, yeah. so uh, that, that, that's all awesome. But I, I want to ask the really important question that I've, I got to ask, which is what the fricking Sam Hill just happened to us? Like the past few weeks, like what is going on? My, my, uh, 13 year old thinks it's the end of the world. So is this the end of the world? Jeff Schlegel Milch from Columbia university. Well, you know, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but I was uh, going to the store earlier and there was this guy on a horse 
Were there four of them? Were there, um, <laughs> was it just one horse? Because it's important how many horses I, there are. Were they yeah, made of I just ice? saw the one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I think that that there's, um, we've been in a lull for a while, right? We haven't had a lot of coastal storms for uh, quite a while, even though we've had some hurricane seasons that have been predicted to be more severe than others. So I think that there is something just about the random confluence of events that occurs. There are a lot of questions, too, about, of course, climate change is coming up a lot. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we're seeing more extreme events for a variety of reasons. And then, you know, we're and, and so, you know, that debate is sort of raging in, at the, this time with all of that as well, too. And we're also building in more vulnerable areas, both domestically and internationally. You know, we're we're see, we're creating more vulnerability to, uh, you know, a dynamic uh, threat profile that's coming in. And so I think all of these things come together. And, of course, we're seeing more coverage of it. We're seeing more amplifiers of this coverage when it's happening. You know, social media is really democratizing the um, presentation of this uh, globally and all these things going on. So, you know, I, I think it's it's definitely, definitely a unique time. And I think it's a, a perfect storm, no pun intended, of all these different factors sort of coming together in a relatively short time frame. So then let's let's talk Harvey. All right, so you just came back yeah. from Texas. So this was sort of the beginning of this. I mean, not the beginning, right? Let's set some context. We have these massive fires happening out in the West. We have floods in, in <laughs> India. Um, and then Harvey happens, first uh, major hurricane since since Wilma in 2005, uh, comes in on August the 26th. So it hits Rockport first. Then, of course, there's the Houston thing. Can you talk about some of what you saw when you went down to the Harvey response and, and some of the, the things you were thinking about the, the Texas response to that storm? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, when I went down, I went down there with our uh, center director, Dr. Erwin Redliner, and also um, he does some work and we have a close relationship with the Children's Health Fund, which has programs across the country that serve um, uh, children in poverty and, and getting them access to medical care. Um, their sort of flagship is the uh, these mobile medical clinics that they're able to send out into rural and impoverished areas. And then he also works with some uh, potential donors and sort of, you know, so we were down there both on behalf of the center as well as these other groups uh, doing some fact finding and figure out what's the best way that we could, you know, provide uh, some assistance through our various avenues and ability to do that. So we, our base of operations was in Austin and we were able to meet with some state officials there as well as go to the uh, state operations center, which had the, the FEMA presence and the HHS and all the federal agencies as well there. And then from there, we, uh, we went first to the uh, Beaumont area that was really impacted by the flooding. And then after that, we went down to the Rockport and Refurio and some of the areas down that where the hurricane made landfall. Um, and I think uh, one thing you'll notice I left out is we did not go to Houston. And the reason we didn't go to Houston is because we really wanted to see what was going on outside of where the cameras were. That Houston is, is such a highly impacted area and is absolutely deserving of all the support it's getting, but it's also such a nexus for all of the attention. And our bigger concern is what's going on in these smaller communities that are sort of out of the spotlight. And in the Beaumont area is where you saw uh, most of the flooding, that's where the storm stalled, and you saw the 50 inches of rain and all of that sort of happening in the Houston, Beaumont, sort of to that northern eastern right. part of the coast. And then, and by the time we were there, it was uh, probably a day or two after the rain stopped in those areas. So it was the very end. They were just getting to the recovery. The Cajun Navy was still out there sort of rescuing people. Um, and then down, further down the coast is where the recovery had been going on for about a week or so, where the hurricane had made landfall and uh, the areas had been exposed to the, these Category 4 winds, uh, but didn't have the subsequent flooding. And so they had actually had a bit of a head start compared to the other areas um, with that. So just logistically, Jeff, how did how did you get there? Did what, did you fly into Austin? Did you? Yeah, this is yeah. The Texas so, boy, he's like sorry, mapping just, it. It's like I'm just curious. How, uh, I took the 109 <laughs> yeah. down to the four. Specifically, like that. what roads? Yeah, did yeah, you... yeah. No, so so this is actually I think one of the most interesting parts of the trip is that we were in Austin. We were talking to a lot of different folks, and we were hearing a lot of different things about some saying go check out Port Arthur because we want to know what's going on there. And that's kind of near Beaumont and one of the areas that was really inundated with flooding. Then other people were saying you can't get there. Yeah. Um, that it'll take hours with the road closures. And by the way, we're sending our teams in there with the armed agents because we're worried about them getting getting robbed. So we uh, we connected with a faith based group down there uh, doing some really amazing work. They're called the Austin Disaster Relief Network. And so they're sort of a hub of the faith based community. And they were doing a lot of work out of the Austin area 
where they were sort of getting vol- uh, volunteers, getting donations, and um, you know, packaging these up, getting it organized. And then they were working with a variety of groups. And the other one we connected with a uh, company, um, the woman running a company called Charlie Bravo, uh, which deals with you know selling used aircraft and things like that, but also works with this Angel Flight Network. And what it essentially is is that in the affected areas, even though the roads were closed, there were uh, uh, in the neighborhood of 50 municipal airports that were open and accessible. Oh, wow. And they had a network of over 100 pilots who were willing to volunteer their aircraft and volunteer their time. So they were airlifting stuff to all of these different sites across Texas. And it was ranging from single engine planes to C-130s. There was like a, a uh, restored World War II aircraft that, you know, looked like it was for an air show. And I was looking over there and they were loading it up with supplies to fly down there. <laughs> the and Texas so Confederate when guard. we went, yeah, yeah. So we ended up in this, uh, this hangar where they were staging all these materials and getting them ready for the aircraft. And then this uh, wealth manager um, had a, a jet that he had bought for his company and was volunteering his time and his fuel to help shuttle some of the, the groups back and forth down to Beaumont. So we hitched a ride on his airplane and he took us down there. And then we, we met with some of the groups down there that were distributing aid all through the faith-based community. It was another, it was a, it was a church that was setting up distribution and they had all of these volunteers who themselves had lost their homes and were putting together these kits that were, you know, included basic food, water, hygiene supplies, things like that. And as people drove through, they'd load it into their cars, all just incredibly well organized. Mm. Um, and they were able to actually reach a lot of these areas um, either before or in supplement to the federal teams that were deployed. So really creating this genuine uh, whole community approach. Um, and, uh, and they were the ones we ended up hitching a ride with there, and, and they flew us back later on that evening um, a, as part of that. It was really, really kind of amazing to see that. Wow. So, you know, let's pick up on this whole community approach and talk about something you mentioned a little bit, which is this the Cajun Navy, right, which has yeah. happened a little bit in other storms, but really came out uh, – uh, after Harvey and really was focused around this new app called I don't even know if it's a new app this app called Zello which is a walkie talkie app that that uh, emergency managers should know does voice communication but it's based on packets I think so it's like a walkie talkie but it requires very little internet you still need some internet connection but it doesn't take as much as like streaming audio or something like that um, and and the the story I read, which everybody should read, which is in the Houston Chronicle, is about this woman, uh, Holly Hartman, who was just listening on Zello uh, to folks who were who were making pleas for help, who couldn't reach their 911 centers. They were just calling out on that, and she volunteered as a dispatcher and worked for 35 hours and helped to organize uh, Cajun Navy pickups. And then some some folks died, some folks were rescued. But but the question I have is this whole community approach. Did you see other ways that this could be organized on the fly like that? You know, was the Cajun Navy effective from your point of view, or is this the kind of stuff that the professionals do better? You know, these guys should should kind of back off. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's one I think that we talked a lot about even while we were there. And I think the, the bottom line is that with the faith base, with the Cajun Navy, with these volunteer groups, is we definitely saw a dynamic where, one, the, the federal teams and the state teams were much more forward deployed. The investment within the state of the hospital preparedness program and the public health emergency preparedness program to sort of create these healthcare coalitions. And, of course, there were issues here and there, but no doubt that that investment saved lives. But, you know, government controls – such a small part of the infrastructure and such a small part of the resources that you can't do it without whole community. And there was really this acceptance of that. Whereas, you know, in Katrina, they were telling people, don't go in. We don't want the liability. You can't do it. Here you had teams that were organized, that were coordinated with law enforcement that would go out there with them. And so it really became this force multiplier where they were working in tandem with each other. I wouldn't go as far as to say they were directly coordinated or that one was directing the other, but there was communication and uh, where the need was met. And in some cases, again, this, uh, um, these faith-based groups were able to fly supplies into affected areas before the trucks could get in from the federal teams. So with the Cajun Navy, I mean, they did have a fairly formal structure. It seemed to be uh, fairly well developed since, uh, you know, the Baton Rouge flooding last year. And so they continue to sort of more and more formalize it. A lot of the folks doing this do have a history in first response and had some training programs and things like that. So it's, it's, um, it's gotten more organized and um, in- integrated in an appropriate way. I think, though, that where um, some of these, 
you know, you have this acute need and there's only so much the Coast Guard can do. There's only so much. And so you really need to rely on this. I think the the areas where I would draw the line and I didn't see any issues where anyone was crossing this line is where uh, with clinical issues or mental health issues, you know, these Mm -hmm. sort of things where you really need a very high level of expertise. So that was one where we we actually the next few days we drove down, we drove over to San Antonio and then we uh so andrew you can check uh, check me on your map there <laughs> and then we right. uh we, oh, we drove yeah. over to san antonio yeah and then we met some folks with the university of texas who were affiliated with the children's health care uh children's health fund program and uh some uh colleagues there and uh so he drove a hybrid car and at the time we weren't sure of the fuel situation so we actually then drove from there down to rockport and refurio and some of the areas where the hurricane made landfall right and and there we actually came across a, um, a camp that someone had set up in front of their home. And this was also really interesting because we, we drove through town and one, it was really interesting to see the, the number of people working on the power lines to bring them back up and the number, uh, and it was amazing. You'd see some gas stations that were completely destroyed and others that were open and didn't really have long lines. So and as we understood it, a few days before we arrived all the way up in Austin and beyond, there would be hour long waits for gas. Um, and the gas station next to our hotel in Austin, the day we arrived, said no gas. And by the next day, it had gas again. So I think we just caught the tail end of sort of that catch up with getting fuel down there. But we were down in Rockport and there were gas stations that were open. There were pharmacies that were open. Power hadn't been fully restored, but there was generators and things, but also just devastating damage in some of these neighborhoods. And uh, interestingly, on the coast, where you have sort of the really expensive homes, most of those were much more intact than further inland, where it was much poorer. But on the outskirts of Rockport, we stumbled on, we saw this camp in front of this person's house. Um, And so we got out and we talked to them a little bit. It said, uh, I think it said Rockport Relief Camp. And it turned out that it was this woman who lost her business, but her house had survived. And the eye of the storm had passed right over the house. And then people started coming there. And then through social media, people started donating. And they actually had really organized donations of baby supplies, of of food, of water. They had a, a freezer truck that had food on it. Um, that was running and they had just gotten some generators for air conditioners for the house and stuff. And the health department, they said it actually certified them to serve the food to folks. Wow. And I thought that that was really interesting because in how many situations would the health department come and say, this isn't safe, shut it down. And instead they came and said, how do we make this work? Right. And they said, you know, you're, do you think yeah I, yeah it, it, let, me, let me make two propositions and you tell me if you think they bear out proposition one is the government is better at working with these unregulated volunteer folks now than it was 10 years ago and two that the technology we have that we didn't even have during hurricane sandy is really expediting the process of these sort of brand new organizations uh setting up do, do you think that those two things are going to bear out in future emergencies I hope so. I mean, I do think, I mean, certainly in Texas, there was a culture that was even, I mean, said directly by the governor, this is going to be Texans helping Texans. And so, but I think that that lesson was absolutely learned from Katrina, at least in this and the Harvey response. I'm not as familiar with the Irma response, and that's just sort of just happening now that the the storm has passed over. But that um, I, I would hope so, because it is one where it's always this catch-22, right, where if you allow non-professionals to do these things, someone's going to mess up and they're going to end up becoming a victim. Um, So no matter what choice you make, people are going to die. The question is which one is going to cause less deaths. And I, I tend to go with, if we want to promote whole of community and we want to promote community resilience, then we want people to step up and help each other out. And that's what it looks like. And this was a way with the health department sort of making sure that it was safe of actually contributing to that instead of how do we get to no, it's how do we get to yes and trying to work with the best interests of the public to get to yes. And so absolutely. And then the donations they got were purely from social media. That's how they got known about it. That's how they did it. So again, the technology is also uh, democratizing disaster response and it's distributing the, the potential for the ownership across much wider areas. So these things were able to be distributed much more efficiently and much more quickly. Yeah. Um, I will say, though, that I only saw what I saw, and I only saw the stuff working from the perspective of the places where it was working. I don't know the blind spots. 
And I do worry about particularly, you know, undocumented workers, folks in even more inaccessible and even more impoverished areas. And I think that that's something where I would hope that, you know, the emergency management community and the federal agencies are taking a proactive effort to go out there and look for the things that they're not seeing uh, as a result of directly coming to them. But but definitely a game changer. And um, I think it's it's really, you know, I'm going to speculate that it's really going to show dramatically in the long term recovery. It was interesting look, looking at these disasters unfold even before they had hit, how government was really acknowledging and pushing this message of check on your neighbors, um, you know, think about those who are vulnerable in your community, in your neighborhood, you know, take care of them as well. And I hadn't seen that message go out as strongly in, in previous disasters, maybe because we haven't had a major hurricane hit us in so long. But yeah, this, this and then using social media, you're we've always had donations post emergency, but they did seem to be more efficient for these emergencies and more focused on what the actual needs are, because the message was really able to get out on specifically what is needed. Money is needed, you know, and these specific items instead of everybody just donating, you know, winter coats to Floridians. And <laughs> Actually, Texans. I saw this great thing online. Yeah. These uh, people that were working at a uh, Houston donation center and people had sent them all this lingerie. So they wrote this long Facebook post about why after Harvey is not the moment that they needed the lingerie of the American community. Well, so I, don't know. I think know, it's gotten better. Could be, it, it's, okay. could be some it's always, always good. Always, always appropriate uh, in, in flooded areas. <laughs> yes. So I think we can say three things. I think we can say from my point of view, after Matthew last year, whole community, I think, finally sold through government. I think people saw it working. It's been pushed for a long time, but it really worked. So I think we saw politicians across the country take up whole community. People really rolled for pre-positioning. Like, I think people were much more uh, eager yeah. to have pre-positioning happening in work. Governors were much more willing to do pre-disaster declarations. Those things were signed fast. That's right. That's all, right. all over yeah. the place it was happening. Just crazy things. And people were much more willing to let federal assets into state EOCs, state assets into local EOCs. People were much more willing to liaise, I think, to have yeah. liaison officers all over the place than they had been before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that there's also this acceptance. And, and I'm going to be a little controversial here and say that this Ooh, didn't oh, really no, start to happen yeah. and, and, until budgets started to get cut yeah. is where, you know, folks started to realize we can't do it all. We need this help that it's just not possible to do. Um, and so there was this acceptance of it, because I, I think the reality is, is that, you know, none of these organizations on their own accomplished what needed to be accomplished it's the whole community and i shouldn't even talk about it in past tense this is going to be a very long-term recovery and but the other thing again i just kind of want to keep coming back to is that you know when you rely on community networks and community institutions on the one hand you get this incredible economy of scale and these these uh by utilizing the networks that are already in place and that's definitely a good thing, and it's definitely much easier. The only thing you also have to keep in mind is that these networks that are already in place are the same networks that are part of the paradigm that um, leads to inequities within a community. So those who are most vulnerable prior to the disaster, those who are most isolated and most disengaged, may not necessarily be served by the same pre-existing. So I, I think it's amazing the work that we've seen done that I, in just a very little bit of time that I was on the ground by these groups. And I don't want to take anything away from that, but I also, like I said, just always want to come back to um, who are the ones who aren't comfortable going there, who are the ones who are not engaged, who are the ones that are being left out, because that's the tragedy that we really saw in Katrina. Um, and even in parts of Sandia, those who are most yeah. socially isolated, those who are most disengaged and disenfranchised. Um, and um, uh, Let me just hit, yeah. hit that back at you without using a fancy word like paradigm, uh, Mr. Academia, <laughs> which is... You know, these right. guys that are that are spinning up these networks, they're people with resources, right? They got money, they've got stuff, they can stand up, they have existing social networks of different kinds. And we so we can argue both that they're um, establishment, and I think I, I'm just going to be a little more clear in that they're usually not people of color or folks of color that are that are have been impacted by other kind of structures of of, of inequity over time. So so I guess the argument would be that the government then it's important that they focus their resources on those pockets of real vulnerability throughout the response, since they're going to have less ability to kind of surge and make these economies of scale that other communities are. Am I understanding what you're saying? 
Yeah, yeah. And I, I really, like I said, I, I mean, government has a responsibility to, to be there for everybody. And I think the intent of these volunteer groups is absolutely pure. It's just the efficiency of their networks is based on certain kinds of relationships. And, you know, um, these are more complex and, like I said, very sort of academic-y sort of terms that we're talking about here. Um, but, you know, th- it's a net positive. And I think one of the other things, too, is that you know, the last major storms that we saw, I mean, this field of emergency management that we're in today, I mean, it obviously predates 9-11, but much of the current climate of emergency management, the professionalization of it, um, really is a post-9-11 uh, phenomena. And so that means that, you know, Katrina happened between 9-11 and now, Katrina happened like like it was less than halfway to the age that it is today. Like this last 10 years is like, so, so it's a very young profession in yeah. terms of the learnings that have come from it and the at the scale and the level of resources that have gone into it over the last um, 15, 16 years. And so seeing these lessons and seeing them accumulate in a relatively short period of time uh, within the life cycle of a, of a scientific field and of a professional field, I think is also very encouraging. And again, I don't want to take anything away from the things that did not go right and the areas where we do need to do more work on. Um, but, you know, it is important to recognize that, you know, there is some progress and there are some things that do go well and we need to be able to replicate those. I think one thing that struck me from this too was that this is this is this same old hazard that presented itself in a completely crazy unseen way. So every year we have what 15, 16, 18, maybe 30 hurricanes in the Atlantic that come out. Some hit us, some don't, tropical storms. But we had never seen something like 50 inches of rain uh, on this, you know, on, on one, on a major, major metropolitan area. And so it was kind of a wake up call for me. And I know other emergency managers to think through their community and like, what are the hazards we're taking to, taking um, for granted that happened to us? And how could they present in crazy new ways that we're not really thinking about? Yeah, which means we got to uh, talk a little bit about the Houston evacuation thing, yeah. I think. And the flooding in Houston wasn't storm surge flooding really unusual because it was this 50 inches of rain it wasn't the wind right right, right. we're nice. we're really anti armchair quarterbacking here at dukes right <laughs> right so i'm not sure so i'm going to just punt it to jeff because he's the guest <laughs> yeah, let's throw it to jeff. <laughs> yeah yeah so our, our center it's in our mission statement so i got this no so, no, yeah, um, so i mean i no, guess you, no, it's but, a, well yeah no go go no you just talk what are your Let's thoughts go. about the evacuation <laughs> versus yeah. no evacuation debate so I, I think that this is something, and like I said, I don't want to take, I, I truly believe that every decision that was made, and I try to approach it from this perspective, that every decision that every local leader made that they were making in the best interests of their constituents based on the available information they had and the tools that they had to process that information. Right, absolutely. So let me say that right off the bat. Now, let's talk about why the evacuation decision-making is not good. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that so it, is that it's structurally, it's systemically a problem. And so there are a few different ways for this. One is that, um, and uh, Mitch, you'll appreciate this. I, I was referring to this on a, on a broadcast as, a, as a, one of the wicked problems that emergency managers face, right? Yeah. Is that you, you have, <laughs> you, you have, yeah, you have, you know, you know shout out to Corntel, right? You have a, a uh, imperfect information. You know, and when it comes to the evacuation decisions, you can say, yeah, it's going to hit Texas. We knew that five days before, but where it hit and where it curved, there's so much uncertainty and the way that weather presents itself. And really beyond five days, the forecasts suck. They're very difficult to, to, to make solid decisions on. And, you know, evacuation is not a no-brainer, you know, and Rita showed us that where, you know, you had dozens of people die as a result of a hasty evacuation. And when you evacuate people, they die. Um, There's no question that you have uh, excess morbidity and mortality as as a result of it. So, again, it's one of those horrible decisions you have to make on which one is going to kill less people. Um, But that being said, that wasn't how the decision played out. You know, Texas is a very strong home rule state like so many other states. You had inconsistency on who said to evacuate and who didn't. Um, And when you're talking about an evacuation of this scale, it really cannot be done at the local level. And I'm usually all for local decision making, but you have a hurricane that is affecting a region. You need to make regional decisions. You know, it's even it's even with if you choose to uh, to evacuate one town, but the town next 
next to you doesn't evacuate. And in this case, we had some with mandatory, some with voluntary, some with some areas that were mandatory, but some other parts that were not. And just this kind of and what you ended up with was that a lot of inconsistency, a lot of confusion, and something that was not coordinated at a state level. And again, this is a systems issue, not a person issue. It's I'm also, not blaming anyone for the decisions they made. It's also, I wonder what you think about an, an infrastructure issue to a degree. You have a very car-based culture. You have limited roads. There are a lot of, a lot of roads in Texas, a lot of big, nice roads, but not enough to handle that that many and you don't have a super strong uh mass transit network right. there too so right if you're going to evacuate it's yeah, going to be yeah. via right. personal it's cars you're just you're you're doing again sort of a biased response that people with some cars might be able to get out but right. a lot of folks can't right um so right was, right and that go ahead I, when i just want to hit on on two other aspects too because on, on the one hand there's the systems piece and like if you evacuate new york city but nassau county doesn't evacuate they're absorbing all of that right mm-hmm. or, or if you know you know the, the new jersey keeps cars coming into new york but everyone is coming out so it's kind of the same thing there is that once you have an evacuation you then have to manage the systems to evacuate and like you're saying you have to be able to move people who are going to move themselves and get to people who can't move themselves who don't have cars and who have that and that is a tremendous logistical requirement that's very very difficult to solve and then you have to do it all and if you're lucky 72 hours right and then the third does and then the third piece is that information support is that it is as again you have very imprecise information and this comes to you know the uncertainty that it presents is that you need to make a decision before you have enough information to actually make that decision and so what i say there too and this is the fault of of people like us in academia is that we have not done a good job of establishing an evidence base and establishing the tools that could then lead to more practical tools, more policy tools to help support local uh, authorities and statewide authorities in making that decision in the face of uncertainty. And I think that that really needs to be the next frontier in the way that in academia we support this kind of evacuation research is how do we help get better tools for evaluation and better tools for the management of uncertainty for this so that um, that, so that uh, the authorities have better tools and better decision making at their disposal it's kind of sad for the cowboys you know the cowboys just like to stand in the oc and be like i got this we're just gonna you know but i think yeah the evidence base will save lives but at the expense of all the kind of you know tobacco chewing spitters that are want to just make the calls from their hip every time. right i just want to be clear you're talking you're not talking about the dallas cowboys football team you're talking about the actual real stats i was wearing. talking about the cheerleaders the dallas cowboys <laughs> okay all right um, I, I just think I, I just think the Dallas Cowboys are in fact sad. So. You guys, hey, oh. we want to know how are the Pats doing this year? Oh, oh, so oh for here's uh, here's I think we should move on. Um, I, F you, Jeff. <laughs> this podcast is over. I'm going to bring this back to Enrico Quarantelli, who never played football a day in his life. Uh, but I think the thing about Wicked Problems, right, is he said you had to link systems of government all together to solve them with clear information and transparency all through that. That goes to kind of this regional yes. model that you're talking about. And I feel like, and I'm going to kind of transition to Irma, that we saw that play out in a whole different way in Florida. And I want to talk about it, but first, uh, we're going to just take a six second break while I get another beer. Three, four, five, five and a half. Oh, five, yeah, I guess six. six. Maybe eight seconds? Yeah. Okay. Irma. Irma. All right. Shifting across the country, same hazard. Different impact. And I think the major thing we saw right off is, first, it seemed like Irma was marching towards us forever yeah. as it demolished one island yeah. after another. Uh, I feel like it's been years well, since Well, even it before that, I started tracking this thing when it was closer to Africa than it was America, partly because there was so much tropical social... wave and somebody... Yeah, yeah, and there was such social media buzz about... The meteorologists I follow about this storm and how it's going to be big and it's huge. Yeah. We're following this thing all the way across the Atlantic. And then Barbuda yeah. and at Skims, Puerto Rico, and then the Cuba response where they used all of their citizens to do every emergency management task. Totally different thing. I mean, we were worn out by the time it even started approaching the Keys. Right. And back to you know Jeff's point about the, the, the inaccuracy of forecasts, 72 hours hours out i think it was actually 48 hours out for it hitting uh florida the track jumped from oh. miami almost a direct hit to over on the west coast then back 
to the east coast and then finally back to the west coast so as as advanced as the forecast has gotten there's still you know still comes down to those few hours before zero hour so since we're let me frame this for jeff a little bit and we'll get him in here is so let's frame the evacuation decision making here because florida is a much more linked state government than texas is i think it's fair to say so you had these massive evacuations really orderly on florida's rest closed then slightly more chaotic evacuations on the east coast as people added mandatory evacuations south of tampa to naples because of that switch in the storm so you had massive road clogs it was taking 12 hours to go 300 360 miles people driving to charleston was taking them days no hotel rooms people were running out of water gas, gas, gas. shortages happening so so i guess again let's look at the evac- the decision making around that evacuation and so um oh academic who can you know just armchair quarterback <laughs> things how do you feel like florida did in that situation well i mean as you mentioned it definitely was a lot more of a a certainly a statewide or a region within it uh, approach to this i mean part of it too is is although i mean of course houston and the texas gulf coast gets hit with a lot of hurricanes i think florida tends to um have a longer history of that and this is where i think the underlying governance structure has an impact And that's one of the things I think we don't always realize is that the governance structure, and you mentioned Cuba, where basically every citizen is part of the emergency response. So there are different forms of government. There are different political structures that um, tend to lend themselves towards one uh, response uh, facet or another. Um, Someone should do a podcast about that, by the way. Jeff is a communist. uh, That's what I learned. Jeff is a communist. If only we knew someone with a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and – and again, it's 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 not for me to say which one is better in blue sky times, but it's important to understand which ones are better. And I think in this case, Florida had an easier time because they had a model for that sort of decision making. Now, I think when we look back though on the healthcare side, where uh, ironically um, Texas had actually regionalized a lot of its healthcare preparedness through its healthcare coalition development, whereas Florida kept most of that pushed down to the county. So you saw a lot more integration of the healthcare response uh-huh. on the Texas side. And uh, a lot less so on the Florida side. So you you sort of saw like two different models at play in each of the states for uh, for each of those. I think also Florida had the advantage of watching Harvey hit Texas and seeing the consequences of not evacuating. And so that always weighs into it as well, too. Um, And again, it's like I said, I mean, I don't blame anyone for the decisions that they made. It is an incredibly difficult problem to do. And um, and as you said, I mean, it was just. very shortly before landfall that the that the track of the storm shifted and was coming up the west coast of florida rather than the east coast and as folks who follow hurricanes know you know the difference of 50 miles can be the difference between um you know a a monster of a storm and you know just a little bit of a nuisance creating some bad surf off of the coast yeah, I, depending I, on the size of the storm a distance of 10 miles could you know or less i i think also there's something to be said about florida being a hurricane prone uh, state yeah. and even though they haven't had a major hurricane hit that it's kind of embedded more within the culture and the mindset of the citizens there and although Texas is on the Gulf I think it's it's not as you know the, the citizens there don't consider it as much of a threat and so that that piece played into those decisions as well I think one thing about the yeah. forecast, oh no you go Jeff Oh, I was just going to say, and plus, uh, Mitch used to work for uh, Florida, and so that's, um, you know, some lawn standing seeds planted that, you know, don't that's give credit true. where credit's due. Absolutely not true. The seeds uh, Mitch planted are germinating into flowers. This that's is disgusting. just getting disgusting. Thank you. Um, I, you know, one thing that I really noted about information in both Irma and Harvey, but Irma especially, was that the decline of local news was was evident. Like it was hard to find really good specific news sources about certain <coughs> towns in the past. And that was really played out to me by this guy, Alan Seals. Did you see this Alabama weatherman who was doing her Irma updates? He's just a local weatherman in Alabama, but he gives the best hurricane forecast because oh, he looks at he looks at the radar and he does it by quadrants. He says, here's this band. Here's the wind speeds yeah. in this band. Here's this. And you can really look at a hurricane and you can know in five mile increments pretty much what the wind speeds will be which means you actually could make much more targeted decision making with that information Hmm. but you would have to be much more careful about the storm and much more detail oriented which is something news is not wanting to be right now do you you know alan jeff have you seen that stuff 
I, I don't, but we worked with this guy, uh, uh, Rich Smith, who's on the, was on uh, our podcast and uh, used to work with the Yale New Haven Health System, and he would actually break that down for us in the different quadrants, because if you were in one quadrant, right. you'd get all the rain, and that's sort of what Houston and Beaumont saw. If you're in another, you get all the wind. If you're in another, you get all the storm surge. And uh, in addition to that, I, the National Weather Service a lot of times will make broader predictions, but they'll leave it for the local um, or the um, – uh, local chapter i forget what it's called but because then there will be variations like you'll have a uh, uh, contours in the terrain you'll have uh, valleys and a big lake that can really dramatically change the the local effect of these larger weather patterns and i think that that's where you know unfortunately the the local news and losing that uh, on a lot of different levels but e- but you know even just speaking meteorologically you're losing that hyper local perspective which could be the difference on where you may be at risk on one side of the uh the town but not on the other because of some uh nuances in the terrain and in the way that the weather hits can I give a quick shout out to the National Hurricane Center? They did do an That's amazing right. yeah, did. job of predicting this storm turning north pretty much on a dime, mm-hmm. um, which is pretty incredible that forecasting has gotten that sophisticated that they're able to make that prediction. And great updates too. Better than yeah. five, like plain language, plain language, really compelling. Yep. Like Easy you to guys, understand. yeah, they should be the authors. They're like the next Hemingway over there. Now, it's pretty know? incredible. And that, I yeah, think, yeah. And shout out to them also from learning from their mistakes. You know, of, of past storms. They studied it, they learned, and they changed, and it's made a huge difference. So let's talk about the Irma recovery. So last kind of last topic here, I think. So we're, we're just seeing Florida now move into this recovery. We saw today uh, the eight deaths in a, a nursing home that was without power. The generator couldn't handle the air conditioning. The staff there are obviously incompetent, lots of safety violations. But, but we are in a place now where... Florida is having an intense heat wave. Millions of customers are still without power. A lot of healthcare facilities, because they had generators, because they had these spiffy emergency management plans, they did shelter in place. They didn't evacuate. So I guess my question is, are we creating a more fragile society because of our reliance on these things like generators by by making us think we're more sophisticated, we don't have to evacuate, but now we're relying on these these technologies where as soon as you run out of fuel, you're you're burned. Uh, you, do you know what I mean? Is this a more fragile recovery scenario that we're looking at? Yeah, you know, and I, I'm not sure if we're creating more fragility, more inequity, or more resilience. <laughs> So it's it's um because on on the one All hand you have this really yeah yeah on, on the one hand you have this really horrible story out of Florida right with this this nursing home and the eight deaths um, which is completely unconscionable and frankly completely unacceptable we've put way too much effort into healthcare preparedness planning over the years that it's just it just shouldn't be happening um, but on the other hand you know last I saw there was over 150 nursing homes that had some degree of power outage. And this wasn't happening widespread. Right. Um, so then it makes you wonder, is this just an individual factor? Is this something very specific to this situation? Um, and so we'll kind of have to wait and see that. Um, but I do think that, you know, when we look at these things, that, yeah, yeah you can't over rely on one piece. You know, it's always like, what is your um, constellation of resources that you have available to you? And even though the generator is running fine now, what's your contingency plan? And what's the contingency plan for that contingency plan? Um, and are you sort of gut checking? everything. In this case, they said that they had these coolers, but did nobody go upstairs and check what the temperature was upstairs? Where um, I'm sorry, the portable air conditioners. So I think that having these things is useful, but then every everything you rely on also relies on something else. So you have a generator, but do you have fuel for it? You know, yeah. um, And if you don't have fuel for it, then you need to still, you know, it doesn't replace the need for an evacuation plan. It doesn't replace the need to have to think several hours ahead if you do have to evacuate so you can evacuate people without, you know, the batteries on their respirators going out. So I think we just have to be careful that with new solutions and new technologies and new equipment that we're not expecting that to replace the need for, you know, old fashioned planning, but that it just gets added to the toolbox. And I think it really shows that nobody can stand in isolation. Even the most prepared facility still relies on these systems like fuel, like food delivery, like water systems, you know, all of these things that are infrastructure, community-based goods that, that government helps provide, but that the whole network of the community is needed to provide. Um, Yeah. So, so Jeff, what do you, you know, just kind of looking at both responses, what do you think are the main lessons that emergency managers can take from from these disasters? Are are there one or two themes that stick out in your mind that emergency managers that maybe didn't go through these can can take can learn from these two disasters? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the first one is that whole community works, but only with the whole community. <laughs> that, <laughs> That's great. That, uh, Put that on a bumper sticker. Yeah. Copyright that. Yeah, yeah. Is that you know, I mean, everybody sort of has something to contribute, but it only works if you're really able to embrace that and you're really able to bring that to the table. And only if the, if the whole community is coming together. Um, and it can't you can't have response without government. You can't have response with just government. Um, and so I think seeing all that come together. Um, really sort of hit that home. Um, and the other is, um, what is the other? I can't remember <laughs> the other. Let me so throw one in while, you, one. while you're thinking. Yeah. So I'm going to just come in for the save. I think mitigation for future climate change risk, so things like the Ike Dyke that Houston is talking about, this coastal spine, the mitigation efforts parts of Florida did really worked. Building codes worked. You know, these new electrical codes that, that folks have, the plans, they work. So, yeah. so really looking at what these storms are going to be like in 50 or 60 years, when they're going to be more intense, when they're going to have higher surge, when they're going to have more flooding, and starting to mitigate building codes now to get ready for that, I think that's a, that's a huge lesson for emergency management. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's the key thing, is that the preparedness work that has been done and the funding that's been used absolutely has saved lives in both of these responses. And we need to quantify that better, and we need to be able to make the business case better um, to Congress and to the folks who fund this. Uh, but it, absolutely no doubt that preparedness saved lives and to tackle these multi-generational problems that last longer than election cycles and longer than quarterly earnings reports. So they don't really align with our current incentive structure, but that they're absolutely essential. And then the other lesson that I think I saw, and again, is a, a positive and goes along with the, the whole community theme is that, you know, we saw folks adapting their organization to meet the mission. And what we saw in Katrina was people saying, you know, that doesn't, the mission doesn't match what we do. So we're not going to do that. Like we don't do medical in our shelters. So we're not going to let folks, you know what I mean? Right. And you can't do that. You, you can't have your organization be so rigid that it can't adapt to the mission. It, your organization needs to evolve with the mission. And I think we're seeing that. And I think we're seeing, uh, it comes down to people. We're just seeing seasoned emergency managers on the health and human services side, on the SEMA side, on the state and local side, and even uh, within these sort of emergent organizations, just highly organized people who know what needs to be done and how to do it right and how to leverage relationships. And so um, that's something that should really be carried forward as well, too, is that it can't be so procedure based that it can't adapt to an evolving mission. I really I really like your uh, your analogy about the professionalization of emergency management, how it started in 9-11, 2001. So by that analogy, emergency management is now like an angry teenager. <laughs> it's like just getting ready to apply for college, you know. Yeah. So it's a little bit, you know, first for our first few years, we were like little toddlers. We were saying yes to everything and bumping into things. And and now we're kind yeah. of getting rigid you know because we want it to be our way all the time <laughs> kind of and also kind of buck in the system yeah, the yeah. traditions of the past that's and, right and... that's right but now we got to grow up we got to go to college we got to right. do things the responsible way and uh and got that an means... 8 a.m class that's coming right up. <laughs> we can push this analogy yeah, yeah. so far <laughs> but we got to get ourselves to yes and we can't just keep saying no to everything that's right yeah, yeah, and I think that that's where I would almost say that we were in our maybe we're in dog years because our turbulent adolescent years were probably in Katrina where there was so much like um, it was so much about doctrine rather than impact, and we're really getting past that, and we're really sort of getting uh, into a place where there is just a much richer understanding. There's a lot more dialogue across sectors, and again, this isn't to say that it's all figured out. There's an incredible amount to, to, to do and a long way to go, uh, but we've also come a long way, and I don't think. I don't think we should be ashamed of that. Absolutely. All right, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We, If you have time, if you have two seconds, we'd like to do what we call the lightning round with you. So, so I have wanted to be on this podcast <laughs> for like two years. <laughs> and I've been practicing the lightning round. Oh, I started no. my own gonna, We got to mix up the to get your attention. Oh, man. So, we might have to throw in a few so zingers. There's no way in hell I'm hanging up until you put me through <laughs> the lightning round. Okay. Well, here we go. All right. First up, what is your favorite hazard? Dirty bomb. Oh, yeah. That's Solid. a new one. Solid that's right. answer. Yeah. That's good. And speaking of er, – er, er, I just want to know oh, – er, er, Yo, yo, go. Yeah. Oh, because we're the problem uh, with with the with the dirty bomb. We're the problem. Yeah, but uh, you, your boss Irwin Redliner is going to be on Jimmy Kimmel 
uh, tonight. So that's the September 13th, uh, 2017 episode talking about nuke attacks. Whole different thing than, than Dirty Bomb. But and apparently both Jimmy Kimmel is really into nuclear attacks He's and probably into Dirty Bombs too. Jimmy Kimmel and Dirty Bombs. That's yeah. two yeah. great tastes together. that go great together. Maybe we can get Jimmy Kimmel. In that's right. Yeah. Just to talk about Dirty Bombs. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's the hazard that scares you the most? Uh, rabies. <laughs> No, it's great. That's it's true, terrifying. says it's the freaking... public health professional. I, I know that's very specific, but it's just, you know, after, you know, even though it's one of the first vaccines, you get it and you start having symptoms before you know you have it and that's it. Yeah. And it's just a nasty way to go. And I remember growing up always hearing that the the remedy for it was like 50 shots in your stomach yeah. with a long needle. I don't yeah. know if that's true or not, but growing they up. They just did that for fun in, in Texas. Yeah. Georgia, too. We yeah. had a rabid squirrel in Prospect Park. Good, good times. Good That's times. true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It is seriously terrifying. When I was in Epi, that was one of the only only diseases that really scared More than Ebola. I'd rather have Ebola. <laughs> Jeff Schlegelmilch, rather have Ebola than. I mean, rather yeah, have yeah. Yeah, Ebola than rabies. All right. Uh, what was the first disaster you remember? Uh, probably the Loma Prieta earthquake. I was out living out in California at the time. Yeah. That's a good one. So That's how many, classic. like what categories of disasters have you actually physically been through? Uh, Ooh, geez. Oh, okay. geez. This is a wild card. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, earthquake, hurricane, um, I guess maybe more tropical storm when it made landfall, um, tornado. Whoa. That's a um, one. yeah. Does a the solar flare count? Solar storm. <laughs> um, We've all kind of been through. So. Only if Elon Musk experiences yeah. it. H one N one. Yeah, yeah. Pandemic. You've been through a pandemic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, a- and and the series finale of the X Files when the first series ended. <laughs> that was a rough one. Oh, that, that was, was a disaster. Hard. That was tough. What was the first major disaster yeah. you worked on? Um. So I, I don't know if it was a major disaster. The first ICS activation we did and was right after we built it were for some Hep A outbreaks in Boston. Um, and so we saw it really ramped up for that. And so although it wasn't, we sort of used it as a test case uh, for one where we had to sort of rapidly set up these, um, um, uh, you know, mass prophylaxis sites in a very short period of time. But I would actually, um, in terms of major disaster, um, you know, I did a lot of work around H1N1. Uh, when that hit, and uh, around Sandy, um, I led the, the System Information Resource Center, which is sort of like a fusion cell for the Yellow Haven Health System that, that our office stood up at the time, and our, our key leadership was overseas, but calling in uh, for each of the meetings. And that was um, that was a, actually a good experience working with some really incredible people. Wow. So, so from the outside, it appears you've had a few amazing jobs in emergency management currently you have a pretty incredible job that sends you to far and wild places like texas but i'm just curious what what's your dream emergency management job um well definitely a featured guest on the uh, dukes of hazards podcast <laughs> nice nice uh, oh this doesn't pay yeah, did we not right. tell you that oh yeah sorry this is man. an unpaid oh, internship it's really awkward all right what's your favorite yeah. disaster movie so it's not a movie per se but season one of jericho Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. That's a smart choice. Yeah. Yeah, just on the movie front, I got to ask Andrew this. Are people allowed to dance in Beaumont now? Be- because, <laughs> uh, you know, in Footloose, they couldn't. And and I just want to make sure they can now because having gone through Harvey, it would be really I'm, sad I'm, if they couldn't. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's been uh, okay. 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 So it's now, now it's, it's a now regulation okay that you can. Dance, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Jeff, what is, what's the uh, the worst ICS position? Oh, the best worst and worst, position. I should say. Best and worst. Best and worst. You know, I go back and forth on this a lot because it's usually the same one. Um, but I'm going to say the best is liaison officer. Oh, yeah. That and I, I'm going to say the worst is probably documentation unit or situation <laughs> unit because you have to rely on so many other people to get your job done. That's so true. Spoken like a man who's been there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. good. All right. So what's your favorite acronym in emergency management? Oh, oh, the fat list from FEMA. What's what? the F A A T? The, the you don't know the fat list? It's the federal acronyms and abbreviations and terminology list. F A A T. I love that. It's yeah. the acronym of acronyms. It, that's right. Yeah. So fat it's got two A's in it. Yeah. Okay, so the last one, what's your favorite piece of gear? 
Like what? What when you deployed for Harvey? What was your like? I've got to remember to pack this thing. Don't say your Columbia T-shirt. <laughs> oh uh, yeah, no. My actually, Acker my favorite piece of gear, and it was probably the most unnecessary piece I ever had. But when I was in Boston, and it was this was kind of the post nine eleven, we all got assigned dosimeters. And so I walked around with like this dosimeter and this pager on my belt, and it was pretty badass that I could detect radiation when other people couldn't. But like there was no the operational need for me to have it whatsoever. We used to have those in um, Florida, and they would go off all the time. People would call what? us, and they'd be yeah. like, "There's a radiation event." And it was just they didn't know how to work the dosimeter, or they walked too close to a, a machine or something. They, wait, all the time yeah. you guys had to wear these? I've never heard of that. Interesting. Well, we like got it assigned and it wasn't exactly clear. And I think it kind of quickly, you know, again, this is in the days where all of us like equipment just started showing up. Right. It's a million you know, and, and, and it was, too much money problem. Yeah. And, yeah in, the, in the UASI days, you'd order stuff and it would be like putting it on your Christmas list. Maybe your mom would get it three years later for you, but she'd get you the generic GoBot instead right. of the Transformer. And, right. you know, yeah. It was like the yeah. Amazon yeah. Prime of like federal funds. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. That's good. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff, for, for being on with us tonight. So, Jeff, if people want to follow you, want to like uh, keep up with you, they can follow you on Twitter, right? Jeff Slegelmilch. And uh, an amazing Bye. podcast I hope people listen to called Disaster Politics. You can follow that, that on Twitter at Disaster Politic. Singular. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? And also check out the – yeah, check out the center's website at ncdp.columbia.edu. And uh, just to clarify, the Twitter is at Jeff Sluggle, but I think I just ran out of letters. So if you just <laughs> want to go for broke and type the whole name, it'll it'll come in. And Jeff is verified on Twitter. He so, is uh, Twitter that's verified. High class, high class all the way. All right. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, cu- a couple things from us and then yeah. we'll be out so uh, our phone number is and we're starting to get some questions uh, 859-429-2731 uh, give us a call let us what you want to hear more of uh, or less of more Dallas Cowboy references clearly um, probably less Game of Thrones on Twitter we're at Hazards Podcast yeah uh, shout out to our Australian listeners we have a good number of Australian right, listeners man. one of them buttonholed Craig Fuke and they were like we loved you on Dukes that's of right and that made my year it frankly. was great yeah yes. that was a good time yeah um, and uh, I, I guess that's it I, I honestly and I want to say in all seriousness if you're out there you're responding to Harvey you're responding to Irma you're you know please God hoping not to respond to Jose the fires out west um, anywhere you are um, just you know thank you so much our thoughts and prayers honestly are really with keep you up the good time. work that's right thank you right so on. much